Hey everybody, uh, officially, I'm Mike Giardino with CrossFit Health, and I'm here with Nina Teichels, who's a New York Times bestselling author, an investigative science journalist, and her book, The Big Fat Surprise, Why Butter, Meat, and Cheese Belong in the Healthy Diet, is the book of the month for September. And what we're going to be doing over this webinar is talking a lot about that book, and then we're going to dig into some other things that are going on um, that... Uh, is 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 um, working with right now. So uh, first off, thank you so much, Anita, for coming back and uh, having this conversation with us. It's always good to talk to you. Uh, we had a chance to talk a little bit at the Symposium for Metabolic Health, and we'll have a little bit more time to dig into things today. So once again, thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Mike, and it's great to be here with your amazing audience. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Um, well, you know what I think would be great, first off, is we, I don't know that we had time last time to just do like an, an intro or background could you give um, a little bit of just background information about yourself to the crossfit community sure um well i got interested in the subject of nutrition uh not because i was an overweight vegetarian for 20 years <laughs> although i should have but I came came to it as a journalist. Uh, I've been a journalist with National Public Radio, written for a lot of different publications, mm -hmm. was assigned a story on trans fats. Uh, <laughs> at the time, this is the early 2000s, and at the time, very little was known about trans fats. I started calling up uh, nutrition scientists, and my father is an engineer, and I had grown up in a family where we read a lot about science. I always thought science was this slow measured sober minded rational progression of hypothesis and counter hypothesis and synthesis and instead on the other end of the phone I would have these found these academic scientists who were terrified to talk to me would be mm. like I can't if you're going to take the Gary Taubes line I'm going to have to hang up the phone right now nobody would talk about the fact that the low fat diet hadn't been you know maybe something was wrong with the evidence there people were a afraid to even have a conversation. And that as a journalist made, you know, perked up my ears and made me realize there was a really big story beyond just trans fats, um, you know, good fat, bad fat, low fat, what, you know, how much, what are, what are, that's the fat is what we have obsessed about most in the um, American diet. And, and I yeah, discovered totally. this world that was just completely topsy turvy from what I had grown up thinking I knew. And so I spent almost a decade researching my book, um, reading tens of thousands of papers to kind of come to this conclusion that I had to prove to myself over and over again, because I was sure I must be wrong. But the conclusion that we had just gotten it really wrong, not just on fat, but on dietary cholesterol, sure. and that the foods we were taught to eat were not going to make us healthier. And it was just sort of the reverse of what we had been taught. So that got me started. And I think anybody who's researched nutrition, I've just met so many people like this, like it's so fascinating. And then once I started <laughs> discovering all the politics and the food industry, the corporate corporate interest behind it, I just, it, it's been kind of a ride that I haven't been able to get off. That's interesting. So was it that, um, project on trans fats that led you to um writing the book the big fat surprise my first my the book i sold was on trans fats actually i didn't set out to write the book that i wrote hmm. uh, and then it was getting into the material i think i spent the, like, the first six months of research just talking to seed oil or vegetable oil scientists because the, that's where the trans fats come from and sure, i got to yeah. do this whole community that's how i learned about vegetable oils my book is really the first the first book or paper or anything to to trace how vegetable oils and why they entered the food supply and how they became the you know the fastest growing food in terms of consumption in the in the 20th century for Americans. Hmm. So I started doing this trans fats book and then I just thought, oh, I have to do other dietary fat because look at what's here. So then my book kind of morphed over time and um, 
Yeah, I really didn't even know what it was until I, I, my editor finally said, your book is really about saturated fat. <laughs> That's awesome. So it does, it remains, you know, like the book that first put together the arguments on why we got it wrong on saturated fat. Like, what are all the components of that argument? What's the history? What's the science? Where does that idea come from? That was kind of the main force of the book. Yeah, it essentially tells that story, which I think is really interesting, is well, how saturated fats became demonized, to say, and then all the different products that were put in place over time to... Um, you know, fill in that gap, right? We take saturated fats out. Well, what are we going to cook with and how are we going to fill in that gap? And all these man-made products over time that took the place and then all the problems that we've had with those. Um, I, it would be cool. I mean, can I know this is a, probably a big task because the book is relatively large, but can you somewhat quickly um, explain how fat consumption has changed over the years? Like in terms of type you know so at one point that's what we ate we ate animal fats and saturated fats and then kind of what happened all the different products that have been put in place to try to kind of fulfill that gap and what's led us to the point where we are today and now you know where should we go from here okay that's a well, bit i know it's a long one cut me off if i go on too long <laughs> but basically before 1900 the main fats that were used for cooking were butter and lard in the West. Mm -hmm. And then in 1911, Procter and Gamble, a soap and a tallow maker got together, launched a product called Crisco. That was hardened vegetable oil, right? Before that time, these seed or vegetable or bean oils, like soybean, mm -hmm. cottonseed, safflower, sunflower, when cottonseed was the original one, they had been used to lubricate machinery in the Industrial Revolution when the whales were hunted out and they needed an alternative source of, of, of lubricant. And then they were able to harden it through the process of hydrogenation or partial hydrogenation. By the way, byproduct of hydrogenation is trans fats, which we don't find out about until much later, like the 1990s. But in 1911, they're like, fine, we don't know about trans fats, they launched this product onto the unknowing American public, whom I think it's really interesting that Americans are much more susceptible to these kind of newfangled foods. And that's the way it was marketed, this huge campaign. Because we are a nation of immigrants, we want to get with it. Our grandmothers are not around telling us, you know, you, you need to cook my recipes. You know, we've left the, all those traditions behind many of us. So Crisco is marketed as the brand new thing, no, no, you know, coming out of the factory, clean surfaces, and that becomes a, a very popular product adopted by American housewives. And then they figure out, but the, they have to harden it and it's Crisco because vegetable oils are inherently unstable, right? Mm -hmm. They, especially when heated, they oxidize, they form hundreds of oxidation products. So they couldn't use sell it as oil until the 1940s. They figured out how to, in, you know, with chemistry in a lab, how to stabilize it. And then you start seeing oil in bottles, Crisco oil, um, Mazzola oil, and it was sold to for Americans to cook with. Okay, so then it, all of this was happening. Uh, Crisco was displacing um, butter, margarine was displacing butter, sorry. And um, fake fats were replacing the natural fats then there this is the most i think genius thing that ever happened the american heart association puts its stamp of approval on these newfangled industrial products right mm -hmm. they and there's an amazing story that um i have just to say that it is actually only in my book but it's it should be elsewhere but it's the original American Heart Association in their own history described this. And then after I published my book, every single copy of this history disappeared from the internet. You can't find it anymore. No way. But, but basically they, the American Heart Association got Procter and Gamble with the maker of Crisco Oil sponsored the American Heart Association, launched that whole organization uh, through a radio contest. Millions right. of dollars flew, you know, flew into their coffers. And American Heart Association was launched on the platform of 
replace animal fats with polyunsaturated vegetable oils. And there's a president of the American Heart Association posing with a bottle of Crisco oil. Okay, so all of this was happening, and this was a, um, a bunch of commercial forces that brought uh, this, these fake products into the world. Then you have Ansel, the story of Ansel Keys. Probably many people know that, but the 1950s, he's this very charismatic, very aggressive, will argue anybody to the death, um, scientist from the University of Minnesota. He proposes the idea that saturated fats and cholesterol found mainly in animal foods will cause heart disease, the diet heart hypothesis. He kind of, he gets inside the American Heart Association. He gets the American Heart Association to pass this as their official uh, policy in 1961. Okay, that's the beginning of all the advice we have telling us to replace saturated fats with polyunsaturated vegetable oils in order to lower our cholesterol. Okay, very briefly, that, you know, governments around the world were like, oh, this is how we solve heart attacks. We didn't know this, but there's a number of competing theories, but mm -hmm. this is the theory we're all landing on. Now we have to show it's true. This is like the classic thing in, in, in nutrition policy, pass the policy, then like <laughs> retroactively try to show it's true. They do these large clinical trials very ambitious all over the world in Finland, Australia, the US. Yeah. These trials, they're successful in that they test what they want to test. Like they get people eating soy filled cheese, soy filled milk, all of that um, mm -hmm. in the 60s. <laughs> and um, and but the trials fail in the sense that none of them can show that Ansel Keys is correct. But by this point, like the ship had the train has yeah. left the station. The poly, everybody's convinced of it. The National Institutes of Health believe in this, and it's impossible to reverse. And now we have a situation where, you know, the whole world embraces the diet heart hypothesis still. Yeah. And even though over the last decade there has been, due to my book, due to I think the work of Gary Taubes, people scientists have woken up and realized that, oh, there's all these clinical trials from the 1960s that just sort of disappeared, forgot about, people didn't know yeah. about them. They were kind of silent studies in the sense that they were, they just weren't cited. They were like disappeared from literature. Our work brought that back to science and scientific teams all over the world have reviewed the trials. And now there are more than 20 review papers hmm by top, top people in the field, including people from the expert committee who makes the guidelines, all of these papers concluding, we got it wrong on saturated fats. The evidence does not support our current policy. So the tragic end to this story is all of those papers ignored by all of our policymakers. I mean, we have literally worked with the authors of these papers to go to Washington, present their results in person, talk to the people making the guidelines and their papers, they refuse to even admit, like even to put the papers in the record. Mm -hmm. So you have science saying like, hey, hey, we've changed our mind about this. And the policy, and that just like, there's a level of policy where they just don't want to hear it. So um, it's a failure of science. It's a failure of policy. It's a triumph for industry and um, you know, I think I think it's a very bad time for science in general in this country, but especially for nutrition science. And so what that's do you, my happy story. <laughs> that's very happy. What do you think? Uh, I mean, why is it ignored? What What is the cause? I mean, is it? I mean, I'd like to think it's not purely, you know, money. But like, what 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 else can it be? What else, what else, why else is it ignored? Is it just this like rigid belief in something that you're not willing to to hear uh, conflicting information like what what do you think it is you know we could talk for an entire hour just about this and it's it is this exact question that got me interested in writing about the politics of nutrition because i realized there is there are not good scientific explanations for what we're seeing right now so part of it is cognitive dissonance people mm -hmm good people in science just yeah. their whole careers have been believing one thing and they cannot change their mind but the other forces at work here are stunning like there's the animal rights movement that does does not want people eating 
any more animal foods. And so the limits on saturated fat really work to suit their agenda. The whole, the vegan movement, same thing. They do not want people eating more meat. There's the food industry, the multinational multi-billion dollar food industry, uh, industry, what we call now the corporate determinants of health uh, that have vested interest in people eating packaged and, you know, packaged ultra processed foods, fake meats, but you know, everything in the supermarket shelves that you avoid, those compete with meat and dairy. So they mm -hmm. want meat and dairy, the main food categories that contain saturated fats, they want those off the table. So saturated fats is like this, um, it's the rate limiting factor on all those foods. If they can keep saturated fats down, they can keep those foods out. Another industry is the pharmaceutical industry. Their yeah. whole business model of statins, the biggest selling drug in the history of pharma of big pharma or statins and it's all based on this idea that lowering your cholesterol which polyunsaturated you know which vegetable oils can do but saturated fats don't do lowering your cholesterol is the key to heart health all of that changes if you exonerate saturated fats so all of these forces and more <laughs> are stacked up against saturated fats and the foods that contain them it's not an easy battle. Goodness gracious. It really isn't. I mean, I, I don't, I just, I can't even, but I also can't think of another subject where there are literally more than 20 review papers, including one, a state of the art review in the journal of the American college of cardiology for cardiologists, a very conservative group, a very prominent paper and all of that science being ignored. So it's a, it's a stunning situation on this subject. I just, as a coda, there was just today a, a Biden administration proposal to define healthy. This is like the word that would go on the front of packages or on the front of foods. Healthy would be defined as foods having um, very low levels of saturated fats in them. There's back so, to that. Also oh, very low this. sodium, another non-evidence-based recommendation. Right. Right. I mean, you get your sodium too low and you see reliably see uh, heart disease uh, outcomes, heart attacks and the rest go up. And that's super interesting. Yeah. Well, what about for saturated fat? What are some of the health implications of, you know, drastically lowering saturated fat in the diet? Because I mean, that's what people are typically trying to do when they follow these these um, guidelines and. Um, uh, the, the information that's presented to them. I think the biggest risk is that people start cutting out foods that provide the nutrients that they need for life. Yeah. So if you're cutting out red meat because you think it's high in saturated fat content or you're cutting out cheese or regular milk, you are not able to get the nutrients in the bioavailable form that you need them. You cannot get calcium from spinach. Mm -hmm. Most people can't even absorb that. You cannot get your B vitamins except for from animal foods. You can't get enough choline. You can't get, I mean, I could go on and on. Yeah, and you sure. need to get them from those foods that if you cut them out or curtail them, you cannot get enough of those nutrients. You can't get complete whole proteins. Um, or you can get them maybe from soy, but soy comes with, you know, some side effects. But so it really cuts out the foods that people need to be healthy. And especially for children to grow up strong and be healthy. I mean, that I think is the greatest danger. I mean, saturated fats are needed structurally for all of our cells in our body. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're actually necessary. But to me, the greater danger is cutting out those foods that provide all these important nutrients. You have some specific examples with children and, and um, women in the book uh, that I thought I was do, really interesting. Yeah. Um, what do you think is like, what, I mean, people love numbers, right? So like, what, are, what do you think is the optimal percentage of, you know, saturated fat in the diet? Um, I think that what we know from scientific experiments is that gosh 
I, I, I want to deliver this number to you later, but in general, these clinical trials where they had people eating what was considered a regular normal amount of saturated fats in the 1960s, they were eating on the whole about 18% of their calories as saturated fats, and they were perfectly healthy in terms of cardiovascular outcomes. So 18% is definitely safe. Um, and if I go look up this paper, I can, you know, I can tell you that, that I think it goes up to in the low 20%. Yes. It's not to say that you couldn't eat more, but um, this is what has been tested in clinical trials. So we actually have the evidence for it. And I, you know, I don't know, you know, you might be verging into the realm where people are like eating sticks of butter or <laughs> right. I, I don't think for people who are um, looking to lose weight or, you know, not gain weight, that extra fat can be uh, can get in the way of that. So sure. I, I don't really think it's great for people to eat, just eat straight butter. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think if you're eating a regular diet, you should just not worry about the amount of saturated fat in your diet. If it just comes whole to the food sources. Food. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, you know, I'd love to get your take on this because, you know, a lot of what we talk about here in CrossFit are the low carbohydrate diets. And um, one of the, some of the questions we get are on the uh, lean mass um, hyper responders and LDL. Like what is yeah. your take on what's going on there? And is that offer an alternative explanation on LDL, if that makes sense? Because the typically high LDL is, is always seen as something that's very risky. Yet yeah. These people are seemingly very healthy right having high ldls is it well that's a you know a very there's a, a some papers out now with um nick norwitz and um dave feldman who's conducting research on them and i think the lean mass hyper responders are a very specific group and it you know the vast majority of their cardiovascular risk factors look great while ldl is is off the charts so you know i think if 28 out of 29 of your cardiovascular risk factors look good and LDL is not looking good. I, 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 you know, in general, it seems to me that should not pose a risk, but I think we should all wait for Dave Feldman's study to come out. Um, yeah. But the subject of LDL in general, um, I, I think is, you know, it's worth just noting that the five year data on the Verda trial that mm -hmm. was, you know, Sarah Hallberg was the head of that. The five year data show that the rise, initial rise in LDL cholesterol is transient and resolves itself. Hmm. So, and now I'm talking about a moderate rise, not the hyper responders. Sure. So, that should be some consolation to people and to understand like if they're doing, and that was a ketogenic diet. So, mm -hmm. if you see your LDL cholesterol go up, that might be a transient thing to happen to you. I think what I discussed in the book and is um, more in the weeds, but really important is that LDL cholesterol comes in different densities. And, and so it turns out that saturated fats raise the kind of LDL uh, particle that is the non-dense, non-atherogenic kind, the right. kind that does not, is not causal, causally linked to heart disease. It, and so it's, so we have to look at LDL with a more kind of fine tooth comb or, you know, a sharper lens to really understand what's going on. And that exonerates um, LDL cholesterol. Mm. That's the work of Ronald Krauss at, and now at UCSF. And, uh, and I think it's very important, but again, it has not been recognized really by, um, by, you know, the American Heart Association say they still are very focused on your total LDL cholesterol. Yeah. Yeah. Just one other really interesting note, which is that, you know, since the late 1970s, looking at these large population studies over time, the Framingham study, which is one of the most famous, the first one to, to do that, mm -hmm. tracking risk factors over time, and then, you know, death or heart attack or whatever the outcome was, they found that LDL was not very predictive, and that hmm. has been found over and over again. Um, and they, what they found in the late '70s was that it was your HDL cholesterol and your triglycerides that were more and better predictive yeah. of your cardiovascular risk. But they couldn't, 
they, you know, the pharmaceutical industry tried to find a drug to raise your HDL, but they couldn't. It turned out that that, you know, was killing people. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> so they, so they, they're, they're not invested in HDL cholesterol as a risk factor, but they are very invested in the LDL cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So again, like science is, has been distorted, I think, by these um, corporate interests. That's interesting. It's a it blows my mind. And when, when, when people are getting their cholesterol checked, um, is it easy to get numbers based off of different types of LDL or densities of LDL, or does it just come out as like your general LDL cholesterol? Yeah. So the standard panel that, that anyone can get um, is, is just straight LDL. Yeah. And, but if you're just getting the standard panel, you can, if you look at your HDL and your triglycerides, if your HDL is above 50 or so and your triglycerides are below 120, that's a good risk profile. Mm -hmm. okay. And that is more predictive than your LDL. If you want to get a sub, you know, LDL subfraction, you just have to ask your doctor for that. Okay. Okay. Let's um let's talk about some of the other things that you're doing. So there are two um two other, for lack of a better term, I'll just call them projects right now, but you have Nutrition Coalition and you have Unsettled Science, which is your newsletter. Can you tell us a little bit about each one of those? What are the similarities, but also like, what are the major differences between the inf information that's coming out of the Nutrition Coalition and then your newsletter, Unsettled Science? The Nutrition Coalition I uh, founded in 2015 because my book had just come out, the dietary guidelines had, were being issued by the US government. Um, they're issued every five years, an update. I didn't even really know about the dietary guidelines. I mean, I wasn't deeply familiar with them as unfortunately I am now, but <laughs> I read the expert report that goes into this hugely influential uh, federal policy, right? It determines more than anything else you could possibly imagine, even if you don't know about them, these guidelines influence our food mm. environment. They are downloaded by all of our healthcare practitioners as the gold standard. They, the reason that all cattle has been bred to be lean is the guidelines. The reason, you know, the food, mm. all those, when you turn over a package and what's on the food fact panel, that's the guidelines. That healthy label, that's the guidelines. Everything about our food environment is um, following the guidelines. School lunches. Schools, yeah. So they're really powerful. I read the expert report, which is like, 484 pages and I thought where is the science I've just been studying for the last 10 years it was very possibly the worst piece of science I had ever read it contradicted itself it wasn't consistent it was inaccurate and fundamentally it lacked all this if you go back over time and trace these re expert reports over time it just it became clear like they had never actually considered any of the large randomized controlled clinical trials funded by our government, the results had never been considered by any of these expert committees. It was like, it was incredible. Yeah, so I founded the Nutrition Coalition thinking, oh, we have to change the guidelines. Um, and of course that was pretty naive, but <laughs> we, you know, we, we've we done a lot over time. Mm -hmm. We have really raised the profile of this issue and its importance. We remain the only watchdog group in the world that is is taking a critical eye to our guidelines. We publish the transcripts of the meetings, which of course then the videos disappear off the internet. And um, we're really the only group doing that. We've now done papers. We published a paper showing that 95% of the Dietary Guideline Expert Committee had conflicts of interest with food and pharma. Yep. We've gotten reports done by the National Academy of Sciences, three different reports saying the guidelines don't use any standard methodology and are, you know, are messed up in a number of important ways. We have we helped get that saturated fat paper uh, done. So we've done a lot of different work, and we've also involved a lot of you know people like <laughs> you out there um, yeah. who've been you know calling their congressmen, calling their senators, writing in comments and letters. We were able to turn around a number of decisions based on sort of just grassroots movement energy, and. I think it's super important that it it can it continues to be a vibrant group. We are just getting in a new executive director. Uh, 
again, because we, we're the only group like this in the world doing this kind of work. And it's just, it's incredibly important to keep pushing up that science and keep, you know, to keep saying like, this is the science. Our guidelines need to reflect this science because my kid in school, because my elderly relative in a nursing home, mm -hmm. because, because we have a military that can't meet yeah, its recruitment absolutely. targets, yeah. you know, yeah. because all these things, because we're spending a billion dollars a day on diabetes, which we know we can put in remission by a better diet. Yeah. Um, so, so that's the work of the Nutrition Coalition. And for anybody who wants to stay in touch with that, I have to put in a little plug, go to nutritioncoalition.us and sign up for the newsletter, nutritioncoalition.us. So also under the chat, I believe Karin just posted, if you go in the chat, all the... Um, all the links where they can get more information on on what you're doing you know so there's the we'll talk about the newsletter here in a second but there's a link to that link to the nutrition coalition and all your uh, social media as well in the chat uh, okay. so all attendees can go check that out and click on all those and um, make sure that they sign up to get more information um, well that's awesome so i, I mean the, I didn't realize when you uh, founded the Nutrition Coalition and why. And it seems like, though the battle is a tough one, uh, you guys are very successful in what you're doing, even though there's a ton of work to continue to be done. Uh, that's awesome. Um, it's really what about important. Yeah, I think like, it's a very important grassroots movement that we all yeah. have to participate in because it's um, like we really have to take back our health because nobody's going to do it for us and because we have an increasing encroaching government control over yeah. our choices and that just should not happen um yeah 100 you know, like we need to we need to like there are in europe now they're they're um they're taxing meat and they're not you're not allowed no. to advertise meat in in some town in in holland i mean it's like these I don't even... could very well come to us Blows my you know, mind. Once that healthy label is on food that says, you know, it will there be incentives? Will, will your will you have incentives or will you be taxed on unhealthy mm -hmm. foods? I mean, I think all of that is not outside the realm of the imagination. It's crazy. Ah, uh, yeah, all that all that blows my mind. Taxing meat just doesn't. It just it's crazy to me, and it's hard to even think that that would be a thing, considering it's probably the most whole food source of food that we've had in human history, right? So uh, it's hard to even think about. What about Unsettled Science? So I know that's your, your newsletter. How did that come about? And what is the main focus in that newsletter? And then, you know, how can people get involved and, and sign up? And I know that link's in there. Yeah, I just started this newsletter not too long ago. It's on a platform called Substack. There's a link in the chat. I started it because it's it's, it's little uh, descriptive line is why you can't get good news, good information mm -hmm. about nu nutrition and health. And it's, uh, I started it because I don't see any good reporting on nutrition, almost anything. It's There's almost nothing. There's almost no reporter that is following the money or even looking at the money. There's, there's almost no reporting that it, that, sh that has a alternative, a different viewpoint than the kind of, dietary guidelines status quo there's um there's just you cannot get good information i mean there's the sort of everything from like the comedically bad like u.s diets news and world report posting every single year keto is at the bottom of its best diet list in january Always. even though that diet has now like been tested in more than a thousand clinical trials and Every diet in, you know, practically every other diet on its list from number three to number 43 has been tested in a single clinical trial. I mean, diets you've never heard of, the Red Engine diet and the Dukin diet. I mean, it's just <laughs> insane how, like, how bad the information is out there. So, you know, I want to bring real journalism to nutrition. I think the whole standard needs to, you know, it needs to go up. I've already seen my work work i've seen uh other journalists responding to it i can tell mm -hmm. that it's making a difference it just can't be allowed to like l just 
hang out at the level of like eat more fruits and vegetables over and over again in every sure. article you read. So I'm not against fruits and vegetables. I'm just saying that's not the whole story. So I've done, um, you know, I've did, I did. I also think it's really important that people get good information on the latest studies and headlines because yeah. I think, you know, so many of us have, you know, well meaning Uncle Bob or whoever who's saying, like, hey, what about that study on red meat and, and TMAO? And it's, are you sure it's not causing heart disease? And so I take a dive into the studies, go behind the headlines, see who the funders are, what's really going on here, so that you have something to have some peace of mind you know, or send to your uncle or whatever. It's, it's really important to have that information. Yeah. What an amazing resource. I mean, it is, there's so much conflicting information and then it's hard to find some, somewhere that kind of consolidates that as well and breaks it down. I mean, there's new finding information. Well, one, you can find a lot of information on nutrition. It's just all over the place and yeah. you're never quite sure what's behind it. Um, no, that's, that's great. So, uh, there's a link in chat, so they can sign up, uh, on that link in Substack to, and how often are you putting out that newsletter? Right now it's every few weeks, but it's going to come out much more frequently. I've just, I'm just finishing up some other pro, um, projects. And I also plan to, um, grow the newsletter and have other writers like Gary Taubes will be writing for it oh, great. And, and hopefully other people. So we will, we will be like a platform for good writing on nutrition. Oh, that's amazing. Really cool. Well, I think I'm taking up all the time here. So I'm going, I'm going to stop talking now and stop asking questions and we can open this up to the attendees and we can start off with question number one. Uh, a neurologist, neurointensivist, and have been very strong advocate for intermittent fasting, ketogenic diet. Totally agree. Okay, that was just a great um, comment on agree, the agreeing with you. People like our preamble. Somebody here's somebody saying this is kind of an important. Uh, they're making the point that people don't follow the guidelines, and so you know maybe they're not so bad. Um, and I and um, mm. But I want to say that is one of the myths out there. If you look at the data, the best available government data on consumption and availability of food, and in every single category that is measured, Americans have moved fairly dramatically in the direction that the guidelines advise. So if you look at 1972 um, today, or uh, you know, we eat like 25% more vegetables, 30% more fruits, 89% more vegetable oils. We have 13% mm. uh, fewer eggs. We, um, we have 28% red, less red meat, 35% less beef. I mean, there's not a single category where the trend lines have not gone fairly dramatically in the direction we've been told. Mm -hmm. So we have followed the guidelines when you see data on how we haven't followed the guidelines usually they're looking at like oh well from 2015 to 2019 our vegetable consumption dropped but if you look at the larger span of time we have dramatically shifted our food consumption in the direction that we've been told so i'm not saying like i don't think that information tells us the guidelines have caused the obesity and diabetes epidemics or i think that um, but certainly it's not helping us that we are being told and being fed in institutional settings, six servings of grains per day, including three servings of refined grains and 10% of our calories of sugar as sugar and, and only seed oils, no natural fats. So that can't be good for our health. Yeah. Okay. So, um, how can we get our primary care physicians up to speed? Um, well, uh, the Nutrition Coalition, um, together with the Society for Metabolic Health Practitioners, is we're considering this program of ambassadors that was very successful in the United Kingdom, where people went out with information packages, packages of information to teach their physicians. Uh, and, um, you know, a lot of physicians are very close to new information, or they've just kind of learned how to be automatons and just, you know, follow guidelines. But I think that there are still you know, many that are intellectually curious and want to be in a profession where they're actually helping people. The harder challenge is getting them enough time 
beyond the 15 minutes they're allotted yeah. uh, to actually invest in a different kind of model of actually healthcare, not just drug delivery care. So that's a, a big topic. But I think, um, you know, I, I think they're just starting out by educating your physician is, is, is something that we could do a better job of in terms of giving people the information they need. Yeah, I mean, that's the goal right now with what we're doing with CrossFit Health is really bridging that gap between fitness and what health really is and healthcare. You know, how do we kind of bring these specialists, whether they're coaches and affiliate owners or physicians or healthcare providers together to actually solve this problem? Do I think high sugar is the cause of atherosclerosis? Um, I think that um in many many clinical trials now when you reduce not just sugar but also things that turn to sugar when you eat them so what turns to sugar when you eat them starches just sugar molecules holding hands uh many fruits are very high in sugar so these are you know collectively known as foods that have carbohydrates when you reduce those that carbohydrate load on your body, all of your cardiovascular risk factors get better. And this is the result that has been replicated and found in multiple studies, um, including studies very high in saturated fat. That was a study done by Jeff Volick where they increased the saturated fat and people's cardiovascular risk factors still look good. So um, there's quite a lot of data on that. All the inflammatory markers uh, get better and are reduced um, so cutting out sugar and things that turn to sugar is, is a very promising intervention for cardiovascular disease. I, I think that is definitely the case. And the other, the other factor I would really look at hard are, um, these industrial seed oils, because they do cause a lot of inflammation. I mean, if you want to read something scary, read the part of chapter nine in my book where I, I did all the research on something nobody had ever known about, which, you know, I found out from these, these seed oil scientists. Um, and that is that these seed oils, when they're heated, they produce hundreds of toxic oxidation products. They enter into the food in which they're fried. They enter your body, they go past the blood brain barrier and they are known toxins to your body. Um, you know, like acrolein, which is what you get when you mm -hmm. smoke cigarettes. So getting those out of your body is also, I think, very, um, really important for inflammation, which, as we know, drives cardiovascular disease. So um, that's yeah. another factor that I would eliminate. <clears throat> um, are doctors getting behind the change in diet? I, I do think there is a grassroots revolution going on in um across the country and and also to some extent in medical care because although doctors may not yet be teaching it to their patients for all the reasons we just talked about but but how many doctors are on the sly secretly doing low carb themselves more and more and more i mean what i hear from my doctor colleagues and friends is that they're constantly getting called with, you know, for advice, like, oh, how do I do this low carb thing? I'm going low carb. I want to lose weight. So whether or not we can, we'll see that translated into patient care is, um, I think remains to be seen, but, um, but I'm hopeful. Let me just give you one other hopeful data point, which is that Blue Cross Blue Shield in um, Michigan and in Hawaii are, have launched programs, keto programs. Mm -hmm. um, in Michigan, it's for their diabetic population, and they are seeing amazing results, and they're saving money. I mean, they're they are interested in the bottom line, and once you have big actors like that seeing these this financial benefit, I think that will be a force for change. Yeah, that's a good point. I do not calculate macros on my fitness. Pal. Yeah, there's some tutorials out there to. Figure that one out. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't count macros. Um, and for your newsletter, um, it's in the chat, but also, uh, what's the um, 
the the link or the website where they can get your newsletter? It's um it's unsettled science. Just search unsettled yeah. science and Substack, yeah. and you'll come up with it. That's the easiest way to do, rather than spell my last name. Um, Okay, somebody, Eric B, saying, most people I work with don't get anywhere near the guidelines, especially for fruits and vegetables, and certainly don't get me started on the RDA for protein. That's a joke. Where do you think moderation falls for folks who want to eat better? More fruits and vegetables, not restricting. Um, well, this is kind of a general question, I think, um, about how to think about moderation and how people people who want to have fruits and vegetables, um, in addition to high quality animal proteins. Um, let me just cut that in a couple of different ways. One way to think about this is that there's a diet for people who are basically healthy, metabolically well, and you can eat more of different variety of things. You can eat more sugary fruits. You can eat more. Um, you, you can have the desserts. You can eat now and then. I mean, you can eat more of foods that digest into sugars. Okay, so that's starches and fruits um, and obvious sugars. If you are somebody who's metabolically unwell, like you are pre, you have prediabetes, diabetes, you have um, known heart disease issues, you are, um, you've got high blood pressure, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. You, your, the range of what you can eat is narrower. You have to restrict carbohydrates more, so you're going to be having, you know, berries, not any kind of fruit, and you might have that. Uh, not as frequently. You might really watch the um, the amount of carbohydrates you're getting uh, from from root vegetables. You might have to be more careful. Have green, more greens, leafy greens. I mean, what you can eat depends on your metabolic state. So um, that's the basic answer. And there's no one size fits all diet for everyone. Moderation is actually an idea that the food companies came up with in order to get people to eat more cereals. They felt like people were not eating grains in the moderation that they wanted them to. Moderation is also very personal. Some people can eat a moderate amount of dessert. Other people go insane, okay? So people have food issues. They have addiction. That is a real thing. They can't just eat a little bit of ice cream. They can't eat one cracker. They are people who like, they start at the top of the tortilla chip bag and the next thing you know, they're at the bottom. For those people, like alcohol, like they just have to stay away. Yeah. And But that's not true of other people. So there's not a one size fits all solution here. And um and people just have to be sensitive to their own, you know, their own psychological reality and their own metabolic state of health, in my view. Yeah. Um, okay, which we do uh, to stop lowering added sugar is a challenge in the clinic. Uh, we should come up with proper material for patient education. What would you suggest? So just off the top of my head, I don't know if you have seen Dr. Unwin's sugar graphics. Um, they show the amount of sugar in different kinds of foods. Those are surprisingly effective. They're just little teaspoons of sugar all lined up that show the amount of sugar in foods. Um, so that comes to mind. I think another really key educational point when you're talking to people about their about sugar is one to really acknowledge that it's an addiction. It is and and to and to kind of treat it like that and to under and and the other thing is to tell people that um, palates change. So what they consider, I mean, it gives the I think people a little bit of hope about the future. When you face somebody who's saying, "I could never in a million years give up bread," are you kidding? Mm -hmm. Or there's no way I'm giving up ice cream. You can sort of say like. Give it a try. I bet you anything. At the end of two or three weeks, that sugar, what what you what was tasted normal to you, will now taste unbearably sweet. Your actual palate changes over time. 
I'm sure some of you have experienced this, like where a regular piece of chocolate just tastes too sickeningly sweet after you've removed sugar from your diet, something you could never have imagined when you started out. So you can give people that hope, like you really will feel differently. You will taste things differently. Your whole physiology will change over time. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's what comes to mind. Um, the China study is, is somebody's asking about is a study that is often comes up by Colin Campbell um, out of Cornell published in the 1970s, I think. I mean, the base, there's two basic points about that. So he found that people who had high protein um, were less healthy, I think. But there's mm -hmm. just two basic things about that study. Number one, never published in a peer reviewed journal. It was published as a supplement to a journal which did not undergo peer review. It would not have undergone peer review because the quality of the data was so poor. Number two, it's correlation, not causation. I mean, that is the basic point about any epidemiological or observational study, as they're called. Um, they show correlations, but they do not prove causation. So, um, so you know, in fact, studies looking at protein do not find adverse outcomes for people who consume slightly more protein. Um, type two diabetes should be labeled carbohydrate toxicity. I agree with that. And, and, you know, there's also a growing trend to call Alzheimer's type three diabetes, yeah. because that's, I'm sure you've heard that's linked. Um, are all vegetable oils bad? What about olive oil, avocado oil? Um, and should the focus be on omega three? So olive oil is unique in that it only has uh, one double bond in its molecular change it's called um, it's it's uh, it's a type of fatty acid that is called oleic and it's found in other oils too but the highest concentration of them is found in olive oil and that makes it um, more stable because the other seed oils like soybean sunflower safflower they have many double bonds each double bond is an op is an opportunity to open up and, at and attach to an oxygen, which is oxidation, which drives inflammation. So you want fewer of those double bonds, less oxidation, less inflammation. Olive oil is made up, it only has one double bond, so it's the most stable oil. Avocado oil is high in oleic as well, and so that is more stable as well. They've developed high oleic um, other kinds of oils as well. Anything with more oleic is more stable. Of course, the most stable cooking fats are the ones with zero double bonds, and those are the saturated fats. That's what means they're saturated with hydrogen atoms. That's, so they are, they're the most stable. Um, so, and should we be worrying about omega-3s? I mean, people talk about the omega-6, omega-3 ratio, and um, the key thing to understand there is the way to get that ratio uh, to improve it is to bring down the omega sixes that you get not just in vegetable oils all omega sixes, but you also get them in nuts and seeds, those are high in omega sixes. Bring down the omega sixes and your omega three to omega six ratio will fall into balance better you cannot get that ratio, you cannot improve that ratio by taking omega threes, you would have to take so many omega threes to counteract this tsunami of omega sixes that most people eat so it's just better to bring down the omega sixes um when i mentioned diabetes somebody's asking i'm referring to type 2. um we all know you cannot put type 1 into remission although you can far better manage it if you are um, consuming fewer carbohydrates do you think there's a cure for eating disorders? Wow, that's such a good question. Um, so I'm not an expert in this. So this is my off the cuff opinion, but I think the answer is yes. Uh, and the reason I say that is that eating disorders, I, I think, and again, I'm not an expert, but I can tell you about my own eating craziness when I was, um, a vegetarian, which is that 
you are not satisfied by the food you're eating. You're trying to eat less, you're hungry all the time. You are not satisfied by eating a lot of bread and pasta or what you're just not getting the nutrients that your body craves and needs. Maybe you aren't getting enough fat, you aren't getting enough protein. Once you start feeding your body the nutrients that it needs, enough fat, enough protein, it's like you feel so satisfied and, and happy in your body. And I think that means that makes you less likely to feel uh, panicked about food or be thinking about all the food all the time because you're hungry. So I'm not saying it's a panacea, but getting the foods into your body that your body needs sort of just calms your whole body down. Also, when people cut down on the sugars and starches and they increase their protein and their fat, they there's a, people reliably report just having better, more stable moods um, mm -hmm. and getting off of antidepressants. So it just seems like your mental health shifts into a better place. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not saying it's easy to get over anorexia or bulimia or any of the those kinds of disorders. They're they're really intense and severe. I, and so it's it's very um, that's serious. But I know uh, some people are working on and using low carb ketogenic diets to in those populations. I'm trying to reduce my sugar. Do you have any suggestions? I do actually. Um, I think the first thing to do is to buy. Uh, and this is like not approved by the diet doctors out there, but is to buy sugar substitute products. So you know, like love good fat bars fantastic in, in my opinion um but whatever you like that is tastes sweet but does not deliver the the sugar punch and insulin response to your body you're not having the insulin go up and then crash which is what causes you then to crave sugar again if you're on a sugar substitute right you're just keeping your insulin level pretty steady that will train your body to get off of real sugar and the ins and that crazy roller coaster of insulin that goes along with it and you know when you need to have something that tastes like a truffle bar or something like you know there's no stopping you <laughs> so you should have a healthier option in the you know around like don't don't like um tease yourself like don't fake it to yourself like saying like i will have the willpower to resist assume you will fail and have resources there for yourself once you've done that you can start cutting back on those products mm -hmm. over time make your chocolate a little bit darker every time like slowly wean yourself off the chocolate i know there are people who just go cold turkey and i know That's they tough. can do that successfully yeah. but in my book you're kind of setting yourself for some people they're just setting themselves up for that binge failure. And if you're one of those people, you have to respond to like what your needs are. I was one of those people. So I, I can say that I was, I was <laughs> like, you have to work with what you've got. I totally substituted as well and got to the point where you, I could finally take those out, but taking sugar out and then substituting it with, um, with those uh, other non-caloric uh, sweeteners definitely helped. Absolutely. I think mean, that's our there last one. Good keto products out there now. I mean, you have to be careful because not totally. all of them are what they say they are. And the keto label is, or the low carb label is, has got no regulatory backing or standards whatsoever. So you really have to scrutinize the label. But, yeah. um, but there are a lot of good products now, I think, out there for sale. For sure. Yep. Um, well, this has been awesome. That's our last question. Great. I'd love to know, like, what are some, what are some upcoming projects or just things that you're doing that you love our, our viewers to, to know about? Wow. Well, you know, mainly I'm focusing on, on building out this Substack uh, newsletter. I'll be at Low Carb Denver um, in case anybody wants to go and meet me there. What? Is that February 2023? Is that when that one is? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, and I'm I'm working on building up a fitness routine worthy of a CrossFitter. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I I go out 
every day in the park and use the little pull-up bar, see how if I've made any progress. Yes, but that's um, great. yeah, and I'm I'm actually getting a PhD, so um, that's something else I'm doing this year. So I have like quite a lot on my <laughs> on my writing project list. Oh, good for you! That's awesome, awesome. Um, well, I'd love to just encourage all the viewers, whether it's live or you're watching this as a recording, to find ways to get behind what you're doing, you know, through you. Uh, one uh, Substack, um, the Unsettled Science newsletter, uh, Nutrition Coalition, and anything else they can do to support what you're doing, because you're doing Thank you. some amazing things out there. And though it's tough, like you've been very successful. So we really appreciate your work. Thank you. I yeah. really appreciate it, Mike. I really um, am grateful to you all. And it's true, like I, I've got no brand, I sell no supplements. So I do kind of depend on, well, I will be depending on, on, on readers to support me. So that would be Absolutely. great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, we'll keep pushing them your way for sure. But this great information. So thank you so much. And uh, till next time, we have to do this again. It'd be great. Thank right, you very perfect. much. Thank you.